Again, my name is Dave Pine. I'm a member of the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors. I want to welcome you, welcome you to today's event and give a big shout out to Project Sentinel for organizing this and the prior events. You know, it's really important to help uh, members of the public understand the complexities of these new uh, programs. Um, to kick things off today, I just wanted to provide just a real quick update on the state of the pandemic in San Mateo County and our response to it. Um, since the pandemic has began, there have been 41,445 reported cases and sadly 564 deaths. So while those numbers are very sobering, the good news is, is that our current case rate is very, very low. It's a 2.5 per 100,000. And the governor has uh, stated that the state will be uh, reopened for business on June 15th. So the, the health data is looking up. Another thing that's really uh, moving in a positive direction is the vaccination uh, rollout. Um, as I suspect everyone, everyone knows, if you're over 16, you're eligible for the vaccination. And so far, I'm really proud that San Mateo County has um, uh, vaccinated or 70.6% 70 of uh, eligible residents have received at least one dose of the vaccine and 47% are fully vaccinated. So we're really on our way to vaccinating the population here in the county. Uh, part of the, our success is due to the fact that finally, after a long wait, uh, we do have more dosages than we, we've seen in the past. Over the last seven days, we were able to administer about 53,000 doses. And our dosage this week is in, increased by about 10,000 to 24,000. So um, we have the doses, we can get the shots in the arms. And now vaccines are really very much widely available through your healthcare providers, through San Mateo County Medical Center. And there are 40 different pharmacies in the county offering the vaccine. And then finally, to facilitate signing up uh, for a vaccine, the county has integrated its process into the state process, which is referred to as my turn. So I spoke earlier about the number of cases in the county, and the county has responded vigorously to try to help people in a variety of ways uh, during the pandemic. So far, we've invested uh, $160 million into our response. About 37 and a half million of that is, is county funds or county uh, designated funds. So we've been able to leverage about 120 million. So every dollar is going a long way. And these investments have been in such areas as rental assistance and housing, uh, food support through our Great Plates program, uh, assistance to immigrant families, uh, assistance to small business. We've done quite a bit for young children through um, uh, early child care and learning hubs. Uh, we've invested in technology to help kids access online learning, and we've also assisted the nonprofit sector. So the, the topic of today, of course, is housing assistance, and we've had six different programs in that uh, area, but the two most significant are the uh, Emergency Rental Assistance Program, uh, ERAP, which we'll talk about today. The, state, uh, the county has been allocated $45 million uh, for ERAP. But there's another program that I wanted to mention just briefly, which is the San Mateo County Strong uh, Fund, where we have uh, monies for rental assistance for families and, and individuals. And there is about a $15 million allocation there. It's about 3 million still left um, to be spent. So to learn more about that, I'd urge you to go to our website. And uh, these funds are accessed through our so-called core service agencies. Uh, which are just, which are located throughout the county. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to you, Mark. Great. Uh, I'll let you, let me go ahead and stop your sharing here for a second. Yep. Okay, fantastic. Um, second. Um, thank you for doing that, Supervisor Pine. That was uh, a lot of information there. Um, uh, Supervi Supervisor Pine mentioned the San Mateo County Strong Fund. This continues to be a a great resource uh, for tenants and landlords in terms of financial assistance. So uh, to learn more, um, please visit their website, which is smcstrong.org. Again, it's smcstrong.org. And, um, and I know Supervisor Pine will stay on uh, to answer any questions um, at the end of the, of the panel. So uh, let's move on. Um, um, I wanna now welcome Ken Cole, 
who is the director of the San Mateo County Human Services Agency. Uh, Ken, thank you for joining us uh, uh, today uh, for this important conversation. Um, Ken, can you um, kind of walk us through, um, SB 91 created a financial rental assistance program that tenants and landlords uh, uh, jointly apply for. That's the most important thing, jointly apply for. Uh, can you explain what the LISC program is, how we got here, and how the county partners with organizations like Project Sentinel to help tenants and landlords apply for this assistance? Great. Well, it's my pleasure, uh, Mark, to join you and Supervisor Pine and Emily and others on today's call um, to, to get the word out, uh, continue to get the word out about this significant uh, opportunity that people have, both tenants and landlords, to, um, to, to eradicate, if you will, or uh, eliminate a good portion of the back rent that may have accumulated in people's lives during the pandemic. Uh, all of us at the county, uh, with great leadership from uh, the Board of Supervisors and our county manager, we have been responding to the pandemic and increasingly growing concerned about the devastating financial impact on, on families, on uh, landlords, on local businesses. And uh, even in the early stages of the pandemic, we began our recovery planning and that recovery planning is continuing and will continue probably for years to come. But today we'll be talking about the first um, significant federal resource uh, that has come, in, come to our county to help with rental assistance. And I just have a small number of slides that uh, Mark has gratefully uh, agreed to advance for me. Uh, so again, by way of introduction, I'm, I'm with the, uh, I'm the director of the Human Services Agency of uh, the County of San Mateo. Next slide. So to give you an overview, uh, and this will be very, very light on detail, but I wanted to start, and, and, and again, I, I don't want to forget to, to welcome all of the participants and tell you that each of you that have taken the time to log in and learn more about this program will play an important role because you can resonate, you can amplify what you hear today out to your neighbors, to your friends, to your loved ones, because uh, this pandemic has touched us all. And um, we're really excited about this opportunity to bring rental assistance into our community. So this rental assistance uh, is our federal dollars, and it comes from the Consolidated Appropriations Act, which was enacted by Congress back in December, the end of 2020. This very significant legislation appropriated $25 billion across the nation to be administered by the US Treasury. And the state of California, uh, uh, as, we, as the state saw this resource coming our way, the state enacted uh, SB 91 on January 20th, 2021. So uh, California, has tr the state has tried to position itself with renter protections that'll be discussed later and this rental assistance to try to get the maximum social benefit out of the, this valuable resource. So when we heard at the County of San Mateo that this uh, resource was on the way, uh, we decided to work with the state of California uh, and combine our local allocation with the state allocation and form a unified program. And that is uh, between 45 and $47 million here locally at this moment. And I do wanna emphasize that this is at this moment because there's actually more rental assistance on the way thanks to the American, um, I always stumble on the, on the relief for the recovery part, uh, um, the uh, rescue, the American Rescue Act. Uh, so there's even more rental assistance on the way and we wanted to build and we went to our board of supervisors with this plan to work with the state of California to build a system 
with um, partners to get this rental assistance out to the people who need it. Uh, I mentioned here in my slide just that uh, by way of um, illustration, the city and county of San Francisco has also received allocations and all the counties and major cities in our state have received allocations. So everybody is uh, at the same point of trying to get this assistance out where it needs to go. Last point on this slide is just to say that I'm, it's a wonderful resource, but unfortunately federal funding always comes with very tight timelines and audit requirements. And that's another reason we chose to partner with the state because we had to build a system uh, overnight to handle the applications, handle the fiscal requirements that come with these federal dollars. One of the really good news items from this federal funding is that the issue of citizenship is not asked. There is no question or requirement for anyone to demonstrate citizenship for these dollars. So I always want to emphasize that. Let's go to the next slide, Mark. So how does this work? What kind of assistance is this? Uh, so that these dollars are designed to, um, to try to retire uh, past due rent primarily. There is in the legislation uh, ways that the state can help with other expenses relating to the pandemic, such as getting behind on your utility bills. Uh, but I won't go to, the, to that portion right now, I'll just focus on, on past due rent. Um, so pretty much uh, every, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about income eligibility at this point. If you're a middle-class person or if you are struggling to get by, uh, just about anybody in this county that, uh, you know, is, is, is working for a living and uh, struggling to hold down a job probably qualifies for the program and we can help uh, determine that with you. But I just say anyone uh, should consider if you have back rent, you probably qualify for this program. Uh, the program is designed for both tenants and renters, excuse me, both ten tenants and landlords. So uh, we, we have concerns about both. Uh, most of, uh, much of our housing stock, uh, rental housing stock is actually owned in our county by families, by small business, uh, they're, they're basically small businesses and uh, family owned. Uh, and these landlords have, have um, had great financial hardship in the pandemic as well. So it's designed to help both the landlord and the renters retire that back rent. Um, let's go to the next slide. So how much relief can you aspire to in this program? So the, the landlords, uh, a, a participating landlord can look to uh, receiving assistance to retire 80% of the past due rent that accumulated between April 1st, 2020 and March 31st, 2021. And, and the March 31st, 2021 is already being extended now into April because April is now past due rent as well. So the actual eligibility, the actual number of rent months that will be in the program to be retired is going to expand. But at the moment, we'll just leave it as April 1 to March 31st. Um, and the agreement by the landlord is they need to write off or forego the other 20%. Um, and this is a, a, would be a great contribution by the landlords. It helps us spread the dollars to as many households as possible, and yet retire a significant portion of the past due rent uh, to take that off the books for the landlord. Uh, eligible uh, renters uh, can participate on their own. If you're in a situation where perhaps your landlord doesn't want to participate in the program for whatever reasons, you can apply as, uh, as an individual and receive up to 25% of the past due rent that has accumulated. And that 25% figure will be touched on later as a key to the uh, tenant protection in the SB 91 legislation. And I'll leave that to, to others to explain. Um, but uh, the, the, the real message I have for you by way of introduction is, is to apply. 
even if you think you might not be eligible to apply, if you have back rent, apply for this program. It's very easy. You uh, go to um, a central website, which is housingiskey.com, and that website will take you into the application process. And we're really encouraging everyone, even if you think you may need this assistance, um, please apply because it opens that door to possibilities going forward. And I think this program is gonna modify and change as we, as we go down uh, into the many months ahead. Uh, along with the uh, website, housingiskey.com, there's also a toll-free uh, hotline number. And uh, there's actually uh, one hotline helps introduce you to the program. There's another hotline that will help you um, apply and go through the application process. And we'll talk more about the application process probably in the question and answer section. And then let's just go to the last slide, Mark. So this last slide is uh, to talk a little bit from the landlord perspective on this 80%, 20% payment. Uh, again, I think the state came up with the 80% as a way to try to stretch dollars. Um, if if someone has been paying uh, at least 25% of their rent and the landlord joins this program, the, the, there's a way mathematically this chart shows you that you could a landlord could actually end up with about 85% of the back rent. So it's, it's um, again, a, a, a opening a door for the landlord to receive a significant portion of the past due rent. Um, so that's the last slide, Mark. And then I just got a couple more closing um, statements. You can just take us out of the slides now. So I wanted to give you an idea. This program was really, um, it, it's being developed as we speak. Uh, the, the call center is open, the website is functioning, the application uh, is, um, is there for you to use. And I wanted to give you an idea of thus far, our county has 1,295 open cases or active cases. So about almost 1,300 active cases in the state system and nearly $17 million has already been uh, approved for payment. So there is traction in this program, but we want every dollar to be spent in our county. And we want, uh, uh, we definitely want people to, to get in and work with us on uh, applying for this program, to tell your friends and neighbors about it, uh, we want, to, we want to work with landlords. If there's landlords that have questions, we definitely want to engage with the landlord community. And uh, we just don't want uh, those dollars to go somewhere else, to be quite frank. And, and, and like I say, there are more dollars on the way. So uh, we want to, to use this money to help our county recover. We want our, uh, our renters to not be burdened with, with uh, that having that uh, unpaid rent uh, to worry about, and we want our landlords to be able to pay their bills. So that I'll I'll uh, I'll leave it there, Mark, for the moment. Thanks, Ken. Thank you for uh, providing that background on the list program. Um, as mentioned, uh, Project Sentinel and the County Core Service Agencies are here to help in any way we can. So, um, and then we can talk about a little more about that as we get through the Q and A as well. So. Yeah. But now let me uh, bring on my colleague, uh, Emily Hislop, who is, the pro who is Project Sentinel's Rent Stabilization Programs Manager. Uh, Emily, can you explain how someone just learned about this program, just learned what Ken said, what the supervisor said, how does someone apply for these funds through the Housing is Key website? Sure, um, and I'm gonna share my slides and I will start from the the portion where we'll get into what that looks like. Okay, just as a reminder, there's some information about Project Sentinel and I just, uh, we like to preface that we do not give, offer legal advice or legal representation, but we can offer tips, best practices and an overview of local and state laws. 
And I can go back to these. I have um, some information about the current eviction protections just to give people a reminder. But I will uh, show some slides that we've prepared and given presentations on to sort of show people what this process looks like and hopefully we'll address some of your questions. Um, so the three criteria for a tenant to, to be eligible are that they, they have to have qualified for unemployment or experienced reduction in income or some other kind of financial hardship due to COVID-19. And we just want to clarify for people that if you've signed a declaration of COVID-19 related financial distress form that your landlord may have provided, this meets that requirement. Um, uh, eligible applicants also will demonstrate a risk of homelessness or housing instability. Now, if you've received a notice to pay or quit or a past due utility notice, this is sufficient to show uh, that you are at risk of homelessness or housing instability. And the third criteria is that you have a household income that is not more than 80% of the area median income. So um, thank you, Ken, for going over the what's actually covered. So here, I'm just gonna let everyone see what the income limits are for San Mateo County. These are based on 2020 numbers. Um, and anecdotally, we've seen that when people um, go to the website or clicking on the eligibility uh, questions, these numbers might be higher. We're not sure what state, uh, what numbers exactly the state's using, if they're using 2021 or a mixture of the both, but I'm pretty sure that these are the lowest limits that you would see. So if you're just on the cusp of one of these, uh, you should go ahead and apply because you may um, be eligible. And the numbers across are the persons in household and based on questions that we get, this doesn't mean everybody's related or has any other relationship other than they happen to be roommates. So income is measured by all the adults living in the, the, the rental unit, their income combined. So anybody over 18 with income, that's going to be uh, put in this calculation. So if you have three people sharing an apartment, but they're not family or anything else, combined their income uh, must not exceed 125,500. And we included the other 50% um, of AMI and 30% of, of AMI, because the lower your income is, the higher priority it is for you to receive relief. Um, I'm gonna come back to this slide, so. I think it works. So this is the website that Ken had mentioned earlier. So this is one way to start the application process. Housing is key.com or in Spanish, la vivienda es clave.com or you can type www.housing.ca.gov. All those addresses will take you to the same place. And this purple box in, in the middle on the left uh, is where you click and it's going to ask you a few eligibility questions. Because this is statewide, they have to figure out where you are, if you're a tenant or a landlord, what program you're going to apply to, but eventually you will get to the application portal. Um, for Spanish speakers, there are the box just to the right, that's a peach color, is that same information in Spanish. And though it's hard to see in this slide, um, there are six languages with um, information and the phone number to receive assistance for applying. Another way uh, you can initiate the process is by text. If you can't complete the whole process by text, but this might be an easy way to go through your eligibility questions. So 211 has, the United Way has partnered with Housing is Key, and you can try even right now to text the, the word rent to 211211 and you will be asked a series of questions that should eventually lead you to the application portal. Now, this is another question we get. Landlords and tenants need an email address to be able to create an account to utilize this application portal. And um, if a tenant is applying um, or initiating the process, they will need to get an email address for their landlord and vice versa. Um, so uh, 
Project Sentinel being in the dispute resolution business, we encourage landlords and tenants to talk to each other if they're going to apply and try to get this information from each other and also to give them a heads up because uh, if a landlord applies, which we've seen, uh, the tenant will receive an email, but the email may not look like, oh, this is definitely your rent relief. It will come from neighborly software. That is the software program that, uh, that the application portal is on using. And the from address will be COVID, sorry, California COVID-19 rent relief. So we wanted to give people a heads up because it may look like a phishing scam, but this is indeed uh, the right thing. And you will click on a link that will take you to the application portal so you can set up, create your account and get matched up with the landlord's application or if a tenant initiates, the landlord will be matched up with their application. So again, we are encouraging tenants and landlords to work together because they, the faster that they can get these um, the, the information uploaded and answered and go through the application process, the quicker they will receive funds. So I think it's worth mentioning as some landlords may have some hesitation and we are trying to, to share information uh, why, why it is a good idea to apply. Um, if the landlord initiates the application process, they're going to enter in the amounts that are owed and be able to kind of check the status of that process. Um, a landlord can apply for multiple affected tenants through the same system. So they're not going to have to provide the same information over and over. If they have more than 10 tenants, there's an ability to enter information into the spreadsheet. Um, and then when the tenant completes their side, they're going to verify the rental amounts um, and hopefully the landlord has uploaded the lease or contract document and that alleviates the burden on the tenant and gets the process moved along faster. Landlords will be able to select either direct deposit or check and, and direct where exactly the payment will be made. They can enter in a property manager's email address as someone else who can be contacted about the application. And like I said, they can check the status of the applications through the rep relief portal. So some landlords have said, but I have to waive 10, 20% of the back rent. Well, there's, here's a bunch of reasons why you're getting a lot in exchange for that. It's highly probable that tenants who have lost work or incurred expenses, that they likely have other debts and paying back rent, back rent, especially if it's been over several months, that could take a long time, even if at all. And in this instance, the landlord is guaranteed 80% of the qualifying tenants back rent, and they're going to get that checked soon. The, um, it should understand for those who have never engaged in debt collection, collecting debts is, is not easy and collecting 80% of a debt is actually really difficult <laughs> most of the time when it's uh, natural persons who don't own any property. You first have to go to court. So that's hurdle number one. And even if you get a judgment from court, it's a piece of paper. It doesn't instantly give you the back rent that you were owed. Then you have to take actions on that. And um, for people who have, who have dealt with consumer debt, you can sell the debt, um, but you often sell at a, a deep discount. You can pay a collection attorney to try and recover the debt, but that's gonna incur costs and uh, including the cost of the attorney. And I know from, other collection attorneys experience that getting 80% of back rent in, in, a few, in a couple of months is probably <laughs> the best, is, is a lot more likely, is, is a much better uh, result than if you try to pursue other methods. Another important thing to note from SB 91 is that if the tenant would have qualified for rent relief, if they were in that uh, eligibility criteria, the landlord is not going to be able to assign or sell the COVID-19 rent debt. So credit card companies and other um, judgment debtors, they are uh, judgment creditors. They often sell the debt, um, get some money and you know, let somebody else go deal with it. You won't be able to do that if a tenant could have qualified. And finally, if a landlord is going to file a court action to try and recover the COVID-19 rent debt, they are going to have to 
uh, include in their filing documentation that they either cooperated with the tenant's efforts to obtain rent relief or be able to show with documentation that they had made attempts to apply on behalf of the tenants. Um, so um, I've included here, I'm sorry, I have a seven-year-old interrupt me, <laughs> um, the link to our COVID-19 webpage at Project Sentinel, which has um, links to the applications, checklists, um, other local resources, um, but we encourage you to contact Project Sentinel. We have a team of experts uh, who are helping rent relief applicants navigate through the process. And again, here is the slide about COVID-19 rent relief and the number that Ken had mentioned earlier. Mark, do I need to go back over the, any of the eviction protections or um, go to questions? I think maybe we'll, we'll see that for the questions. Um, if there are folks who have specific questions about the application process, um, let's, let's, let's wait for that part. So, um, mm -hmm. so um, now let's, uh, as I were kind of talking about the questions, um, I'm sure there's many folks in, in the audience who have questions. And so let me just kind of go and repeat the process to ask questions again. Um, you can submit your questions uh, at the bottom of the screen. There's a Q&A box. You can go ahead and submit there. And then Christina will, um, uh, will review the question and uh, read the questions uh, out loud. But uh, in the meantime, I do have several questions that were submitted ahead of time uh, to kind of get us started, kind of get us started. So let me ask those questions. Um, uh, and this can go for, for Ken or for Emily or for Supervisor Pine. Um, in terms of the 15 day notice um, and the declaration notice that was mentioned um, that a landlord needs to provide, uh, does the landlord need to provide those documentation um, every month for um, payments that are missed? So there's no uh, firm answer on this. We just suggest that these, these declaration notices, I'm going to share my screen again because we have a slide with those. Um, those declaration notices have listed all the months that the tenant may be in arrears. Um, and oh, let me go back one. And um, I don't have the blow up of it, but you can list each month that the tenant has missed the rent payment or how much the rent was due and what uh, was owed. Um, you just need to use these state forms because they have specific language in them. Um, but it would be there, it'd be a large onus to do that every month, but it's a good idea to do it um, and provide the tenant with that blank declaration form that's required to be served with a 15 day notice because this notifies them of their rights and it also provides them the documentation they would need to show financial hardship, which is the declaration. Um, there was a notice that was supposed to be served with um, on all tenants with any back rent. Um, that was supposed to be served by February 28th. We understand that this may, landlords may not have known. We just uh, strongly recommend that if you do serve a 15 day notice to also download the notice from the state of California that was required to be served on um, tenants with any unpaid rent since uh, last March. And we have links to uh, those forms here, um, which I will drop in the chat. They're available in multiple languages um, on the state's website and um, Spanish. Um, also another tip is uh, that if you know the tenant is, is uh, English is not their primary language. Even if you negotiated the contract in English, it, it might be a good idea to also give them these notices in their native language if it's, if it's one of the six that's provided. Also let the tenant know how they are supposed to return it to you. And that could be by taking a picture um, with their phone and texting it to you after they've signed. Uh, the next question that was submitted to me or, or earlier was, can a landlord assess late fees for rent that's not paid? Mm -hmm. um, for COVID-19 rent debt for impacted tenants? No. And I will note, because we've realized this with the application portal and 
uh, will echo Ken's sentiment that the system is still being built and improved upon, there is a box in the application form that has that says late fees. There really shouldn't be any in there because under SB 91, you're not permitted to collect them. And you have to enter in 0.00 to move on. But this can be misleading. Um, we, I, if a landlord enters in a late fee, I don't know what they're gonna do on the back end, but the law precludes it for impacted tenants. Great, and then the, one more uh, early submitted question was, uh, what are the conditions where a landlord can pursue an unlawful detainer under SB 91? I'm glad I have these slides. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> until June 30th, all tenants, all residential tenancies in California are covered by just cause for eviction protections. And for those who don't know what that means, it means that there's limited circumstances where a tenancy can be terminated and there has to be a legally valid reason for just cause that is, uh, that is occurring and that is included on the notice. So we have, Oh, I didn't include that slide. Okay, there's two types of, of just causes. There's one where the tenant has done something at fault and there's some ones where the landlord, um, it's no fault of the tenant, like owner move in. So if the tenant has done something wrong, the landlord thinks they've breached some provision of the lease before they can give a notice of termination, they need to give the tenant an opportunity to fix the problem if it's fixable. And that's often called a, a notice to cure or notice to cease. Um, and if they do not, then the, the landlord can take steps um, to terminate the tenancy. However, there are, if the tenant has COVID-19 rental debt, the landlord has to make sure that this is not in retaliation for having that rental debt, that it's actually due to an actual problem. Um, there are strong uh, retaliation um, penalties in SB 91. Um, so we just want uh, landlords to be aware. As for the no-fault causes, um, where the tenant hasn't done anything wrong, they, the protection, protections in AB 1482 apply, but they're even further limited. And the one I will point out, because we get this question a lot, is simply putting a property for sale is not listed as just cause. There's a specific line that a, if a unit is in contract with a buyer who intends to occupy that unit, then that is a just cause for terminating the tenancy but simply putting a unit up for sale um, before June 30th, uh, you cannot terminate the tenancy um, unless the buyer is going to occupy the property. Okay, so, so Mark? Yes, Ken. Um, I just wanted to uh, switch back to the application process just for a moment, and I'm sure, sure there'll be questions down the line, but I wanted to, to follow up a little bit, of, a couple of things that Emily said in her presentation about the applications process, which was, an excellent description, but I did want to um, mention a couple of things on follow-up. Uh, Emily mentioned that there could be a difference between the eligibility income levels uh, in the local, the local county um, income eligibility charts and the state's income eligibility ch charts. And that's a great point because there is a slight difference. The state calculates the federal um, standards or data a little bit differently. But what, what someone can do if they think they're on the cusp of qualifying, they can go to the Department of Housing uh, website at the county, which is basically the housing authority. So our local housing authority, San Mateo County Housing Authority publishes uh, both sets of charts. So you can, if you think you're in between, uh, you can go to the website there and see the difference between the state uh, calculation and the local income. That's on income to qualify. Um, the second thing is, I, I, I really didn't mention, and Mark, you had asked me to touch on uh, uh, LISC, which is the low, is, is the uh, local initiative support corporation. And LISC is the, a nonprofit group that the, that the state has hired to administer the rental relief program. So if anybody hears about LISC or that group, they're just the vendor behind the scenes really that is um, putting together this process. Now LISC is um, 
contracting with local nonprofits uh, directly. Uh, some of our core agencies have gotten uh, some funding from LISC and uh, uh, some, some of our other groups here locally. So, um, so, so LISC is involved, but I didn't want, I didn't really mention that because I didn't want to really confuse people with too many uh, details. But I do want to say that our board of supervisors recently um, provided additional funding to backstop the cost of um, helping people with applications. So if there's any kind of point I can get across is if anybody tries to apply, whether you're a landlord or, it's, or a renter, and you run into trouble, don't throw up your hands and give up. You know, ask for help, reach out to us, and we'll, we'll assign someone to help you individually um, get through the application process. Thanks. Thank you, Ken. Uh, it looks like we actually have several questions in the uh, uh, audience. Um, Christina, is there, uh, do you want to lead us off with some questions? Sure, yeah, we're getting some great questions. We're doing our best to answer them um, in the Q&A feature, but um, we also wanted to answer some of them live. Um, I think the first one, um, Emily, I, I wonder if you can take this one. Um, does SB 91 also apply to commercial property such as a barbershop? So I just wanted to take this live to emphasize that SB 91 covers residential tenancies and the um, rent relief funds are for residential rent relief. But um, I checked in on the legislature just this week and it seems that there's some bills being proposed to address um, commercial, um, commercial back rent needs and other things. And maybe someone from the county um, can discuss if anything is happening on the county uh, side. Supervisor Pine, is that more of a, maybe someone should contact the San Mateo County Strong Fund in terms of commercial property? Is that something? Yeah, yeah. Definitely that, uh, that anyone with that situation can contact um, the, 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 uh, um, the fund. Uh, we also are monitoring the situation legislatively and, and Supervisor Pine might, might know a little bit more than I, but um, you know, there's a, there's a great deal of relief uh, coming our way, you know, our, our way being the state of California. And it takes, a, it takes many months for it to trickle to the county level, but we're, we're monitoring very closely. And I think that it is likely to expect that there will be additional relief for businesses um, uh, that, have, that have had hardships as well. I, I don't know, Dave, if you want to uh, comment yeah, I, on that. Don't think I can add to that other than to contact the San Mateo County Strong Fund in the time being before these mm -hmm. programs emerge. Great. Uh, Christina, next question. Um, yeah, I think this is for Ken. Um, it's is data of active applications available at the city level, not just the county? Excellent, excellent question because the the data regarding who is applying i mean no, i'm not talking about individual privacy data i'm talking about uh we are working with the state and we're on weekly calls with the state and with lisc uh and we we are get we are about to get access to the information behind the application portal so that we can know which jurisdictions these applications are coming from. Because if we, if we map this out and we realize that there are gaps across the county in terms of um, people applying for the program, either landlords or tenants, we want to redouble our outreach efforts uh, to target. So yes, the, the information, the non-private information is going to be, I believe down to a zip code level uh, shortly. So that we'll be able to look at uh, at it as jurisdictions, and also the state is doing some very innovative uh, geo mapping uh, about uh, the demographics of the people who are either in or not in the program, because we want to make sure that equity is uh, is you know, a primary issue here to make sure that we reach the people that really need the help. Great, thanks, Christina. Yeah, um, so some questions that we wanted to answer live. Um, 
we, we did answer them um, in the Q&A feature, but I think this applies to many people. Um, one of them is, um, I'm a landlord. Um, should I apply through the county or the state? You should, you should definitely apply through, this, through the state program, the Housing is Key program. Uh, our SMC Strong has been a great uh, local um, partnering of, of private foundation dollars and, and some county dollars, but it just, it, it really, when you look at the burden of unpaid rent that we th think is out there, the universe of unpaid rent, it's, it's so enormous that really we, we need people to go to the state um, program so that we maximize that benefit. Great. Or do both, or do both. Uh, now, if you apply to both, there's no problem with that in the sense that there's a cross check so that people aren't doubling up on resources. So can let me follow up on a question because I've had I've gotten calls from folks who are potentially like maybe the next month aren't able to pay their rent. If the amount is low enough, do you think they should go to the San Mateo County Strong Fund or go to the, the state program? Well, it was a, a very good question, uh, Mark. And there, unfortunately, as we said, the system you know, from the call center on up is being built in a very rapid fashion. So there's always going to be miscommunication. So we heard early on that some people called in with small amounts of rent burden and were told to go ahead and go to a local agency for help. The state has since reversed that and made sure that the call centers understand that we don't, that the system doesn't care about the amount we need, we, we, this program is meant to help everybody no matter what the amount is. is. So I'd say definitely don't, uh, just because it's a fairly small amount of money, I'd say definitely still a uh, program. Housing is key. Great, thank you, Ken. Christina? Yeah, um, the next one is, I'm a landlord in San Mateo County. What happens if my tenants don't have an email address when I'm submitting the application? A uh, gr great question, and I, I'll just say that we were worried about, you know, any, any and again, this is an equity issue as well uh, for people who are not um, easily engaged in the digital world and digital culture. Um, but this program really couldn't be done without doing it, uh, you know, online. So the fallback position is if you don't have an email address and you can't see a way to easily create one like by going to the libraries are open again um, or, or using a, a, a public access uh, computer to create uh, a, an email account you can um, go to any one of the core uh, service agencies in our county and if you're not familiar with the cores I just encourage you to call 211 and they'll tell you where the nearest core services agency is and will assist uh, you'll get assistance in creating um, a, an email address that'll meet this purpose. I don't know if Emily, if you know of other other avenues for people for uh, email addresses. Um, we get we're getting this question a lot, and we're um, you know some some individuals are having their son or daughter help out, either set up an email for them or use their email. Um, I'll, and many of the core agencies that are partnering will help people in setting up an email account and how to use it. Um, uh, and I'm, it's good to know that the libraries are there because that's a, a function that libraries can serve too. Christina, a couple more questions. Yes. Um, one question is: Is the county considering extending the extending the eviction moratorium? I would say at, at this juncture that the, the county is 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 not. Um, it's the county is, is just trying to support landlords and tenants through these programs that we've created. Um, so at at, the, at this time, I would say the county is not. Okay, Christina. Yeah, um, we only have time for a few more. If we don't get to your question, um, we will be sending a follow-up email to everyone where you can um, ask us additional questions and we will respond. So just wanted to note that as well, since we are running out of time. Um, let's see. Um, 
I applied, this is an interesting one. I applied for rent relief and started my tenant to apply, but she is putting off finishing her application. I asked her for the docs needed and she says yes, but always has an excuse when I ask her, I don't think she wants to move forward. What can I do? Mark, should we encourage them to call our yeah, it, that might be a, a situation where they call us or one of our Samaritan House, which is the core service agency that's leading this in terms of, the, uh, we're happy to kind of talk it through and see how we can provide some assistance to encourage uh, that individual to apply because it really it would be uh, beneficial to that person to provide the necessary information. And it could be that maybe um, they don't have the the ability to do so, they don't have a computer to do so, but we can we can figure something out to help them out. And I'll, I'll make sure to provide my phone number at the end of this. So. Christina, I think we have one more time for one more question. Uh, yes, um, do you know of any resources to assist families who owe back rent during the pandemic but are no longer residing at the previous residence? Hmm. You know, that's, that's not a question that I've run up against thus far. It's something that I could certainly uh, check with the state on. Uh, you know, my first inclination, I don't know if, if Emily or Mark would have an opinion about this, but it, it's still back rent. And the purpose, I mean, with the fact that you've moved on and you're somewhere else, it's still back rent. So I don't know. Is yeah. there Unfortunately, with the rent relief program, the main goal is to keep people housed in their current residence. And unfortunately, it's that program is not available for tenants who have moved out. We get this question very frequently because we know that that's the case. Um, we are hopeful that the state legislature um, will address this in future funding. And we know local programs are taking this into account and through their normal um, homelessness prevention systems and programs. But unfortunately, this, this particular program can't be used for that. And I, I would say again that, thanks for that clarification. And I, I just say again that the, um, the SB 91 and this rental program was, des was quickly designed at a time before uh, the federal government passed the um, American uh, uh, Rescue Plan. So I really think legislatively, this program is going to be modified. And I mentioned that earlier. We, we can't guarantee it, we can't bank on it, but that is one of, there, there are many policies in the program that could change and that could be one of them. So I'd encourage that person to stay tuned and stay linked uh, for, for, for future information. I don't know of any other immediate source to direct them to. Yeah. Just to touch on, on Ken's point, um, I was on a panel with uh, assembly member David Chu, which is the author of the uh, SB 91. And that was a question that was asked, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in June, uh, potentially. And he did say that he was going to look at legislative fixes and uh, ask um, the legislature to pass an extension uh, to the moratorium. Um, mm -hmm. So um, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be an ongoing conversation uh, with, uh, with tenants and, and realtors and um, both um, assembly and the Senate in terms of trying to pass some sort of relief. Um, I think there's, that's the, it's a question of uh, what's gonna be in this, in this new bill, but I would encourage anyone to, to reach out to their local legislators and ask, um, you know, what version of the bill do they think that's gonna be passed? Um, Cause I'm pretty sure we'll hear a lot more about it as we get closer to June. Mm -hmm. So now we're coming up to the hour now. And so I just wanted to say thank you again to Supervisor Dave Pine. Uh, Ken Cole and Emily Hislop for joining us today and to the audience for participating. This was a, a, a great uh, number of individuals who, who registered and, and who are attending. Um, I, I really, really appreciate uh, just the ongoing participation um, from the from folks all over the county who are interested in this. And so um, I think we really learned some valuable information. So if you have any further questions outside of this, um, uh, forum, uh, please don't hesitate to contact us at Project Sentinel. Our phone number for the San Mateo County uh, helpline is 650-399-2149. And you can also visit our website at housing.org. 
uh, to learn more about our organization. So I would like to thank again, everyone for participating and have a great rest of your day.